Hello everybody and welcome to another uncanny episode of History of the Marvel Universe. For today's video, we're looking at another selection of strange stories from before the Marvel Age of Heroes. And this time I'll be spotlighting ten tales, one from each year from 1952 to 1961. But first, if you enjoy this kind of video, be sure to leave a like and let me know in the comments. And in fact, while you're down there, dear viewer, I have a challenge for you. Can you predict how any of these stories are going to go? Let me know how many of these endings you guess and which ones caught you by surprise. Our first story today comes from Journey into Mystery number one and is called Haunted. We begin with a chilling old house, one which had fallen into a state of disrepair from years of neglect. Regardless, it seemed to suit the purposes of a mysterious figure in a long coat who came upon the property. He carefully checked the building to confirm that it was safely unoccupied. Apparently, he had been chased away from previous hiding places, but this appeared to be the perfect spot for him. But then he suddenly heard the sound of an engine approaching, followed shortly by footsteps within the house. It was a man and a woman looking to buy a house, as well as the realtor who sought to sell them this one. The couple were obviously perturbed by the state of the property, but the realtor assured them that the foundations were strong and the house could be repaired. He insisted that the only reason the asking price was so low was because people thought the old place was haunted. But he suspected that the young couple were too smart to believe in such ghost stories. However, the figure lurking in the dark decided to use this superstition to his advantage. When the realtor's flashlight went out, the figure stalked forward silently, catching the young woman's attention. And this plan worked as the terrified trio quickly stumbled away, never to return. Left alone again, the mysterious ghostly figure was quite pleased with himself. After all, the living had managed to chase him away before, but it seems he'd finally found a house that he could haunt in peace. Our next tale comes from Journey into Unknown Worlds, number 15, from 1953, and is called They Crawl by Night. As such, this tale begins one night in an old psychiatric hospital, where a patient named Mike Webster awakened to the horrifying sight of man-sized crab people scuttling across the floor. Bolting out of bed, he rushed to the doctors in a mad panic to tell them what he saw. Of course, they didn't believe him and took Mike back to the communal sleeping room where no crabs were in sight. When he continued to press the issue, Mike was sedated and put back to bed. He was quietly terrified the following morning, and when night fell again, Mike again saw the crab men. But this time, instead of running or screaming, he sneakily followed the strange creatures. As he pursued the crab men into a broom closet, Mike discovered a secret, hidden passageway. He followed the tunnel down into the earth where he discovered an entire civilization of crab people. It seems that the strange creatures were able to pass their curse on to humans and planned on converting the entire world into crab men, starting with those whose warnings would go ignored. And indeed, when Mike rushed back up, raving about what he'd seen, the doctors decided to restrain him until he could be transferred to a higher security wing. And that night, alone and unable to move, Mike Webster could do nothing to stop what happened next. He watched in horror as a crab man emerged from the darkness and approached, slowly, steadily, inching its way towards him. However, Mike could feel the sedative he was given, and despite his terror, he began to lose consciousness, just as he felt the teeth of the crab man sink into his flesh. He awakened the next morning to find himself completely transformed into one of them. With his restraints ripped by the change and the other patients infected as well, Mike went to show the doctors what had happened. 
but his caretakers simply remarked that he looked perfectly normal to them. The next story is from 1954's Marvel Tales number 120, and is called The Commissar. This somber story takes place in a humble village behind the Iron Curtain, where the people's beloved mayor, Malakoff, had been hanged. This was so he could be replaced by the brutal Commissar Barbatov, a representative from Moscow. Early in his rule, Barbatov was approached by a bumbling oafish man named Stefan, who insisted that he could work for him. He may have been a buffoon, but Stefan displayed unwavering loyalty, even in the face of the Commissar's abuses, and so Barbatov decided to use him. Meanwhile, a system was set up to spy on those who were in the Commissar's office via a phony wall safe. The dial on the supposed safe was actually a hidden microphone, allowing the Commissar to listen and record from the supply closet on the other side of the wall. For example, in one instance he left two individuals he suspected of subversive activity alone in his office. While others he'd tried this with remained tight-lipped, these two spoke of their plans to strike against him. The two insurgents were promptly arrested, interrogated, and badly beaten. Barbatov's men found and confiscated bombs belonging to the rebels, including a bottle of nitroglycerin, a highly explosive chemical so unstable that simply dropping the bottle could cause it to detonate. These items were stored alongside other weapons in the supply room on the other side of the phony wall safe. But the following morning, more villagers rose up against the commissar, seeking to overthrow him. Soon the rebels outnumbered Barbatov's loyalists, and the commissar's guards were all killed. Even Stefan had taken refuge inside the supply closet, locking the door behind him. In desperation, Barbatov ripped the circular microphone out of the wall and thrust his arm into the hole, demanding that he be handed a grenade to use on the crowd. However, the item that was placed in his palm was larger than a grenade, too large, in fact, to pull back through the hole. Stefan then walked out of the closet to address the crowd, declaring that his father, Mayor Molokov, had been avenged and led the people away from the building. Meanwhile inside, the commissar, with his arm still in the hole, held the bottle of nitroglycerin, unable to safely put it down, unable to pull it out of the hole, and unable to hold on forever as his arm slowly grew more and more tired. The next story for this week's video comes from 1955's Strange Tales number 34 and is titled The Strange Room. This yarn begins with a married couple, Jim and Helen Howard, as they attempt to check into a hotel on a cold December night. It seems the only vacant room there was unavailable, having been locked up some time ago. However, as the bickering couple began to cause a scene, the hotel staff decided to acquiesce. Still, the Howards continued to fight and argue at each other's throats the entire way up the stairs. The room itself was stale and dusty, having not been used in the past year. But upon entering, a strange dizziness came over the couple, and something about them changed. Suddenly, they didn't want to fight anymore. It was as if they remembered everything they'd loved about one another. Overjoyed by their rediscovered passion, they decided to celebrate with a special dinner. But only an hour later, while in the dining room together, their enmity for each other returned. They retired back to the room, and once inside, they fell under its sway once more. While they couldn't explain it, they realized that the room itself was reigniting their love and elected not to leave again. And so over the following week, they spent most of their time together in the room, with only one of them ever leaving at a time. The hotel staff rarely saw either of the Howards until finally on New Year's Eve, an employee named Carter ran into Jim on his way back upstairs. 
When Jim explained that the room had helped greatly with his relationship, Carter remarked that the room's last occupants were another couple who also spent all of their time together. Of course, what he neglected to mention was the reason the room had been locked up tight in the intervening months. That exactly one year ago, on New Year's Eve, the seemingly happy husband who stayed in that room murdered his wife in cold blood. This 1956 story from Strange Tales of the Unusual number 2 is called Man Afraid. The man in question was named Steve, and one day he sensed somehow that his boss, Mr. Johnson, was not normal. This all began when he entered his empty office only for Johnson to seemingly materialize out of nowhere. Steve tried to rationalize this considering that he was imagining things. But he realized that for a while now he'd had this sense, sometimes feeling that there was something inhuman about certain people around him. He began to suspect that aliens were hiding among humanity, but knew that nobody would ever believe him. Furthermore, he began to grow paranoid, thinking that his boss knew that he'd seen him appear. He fled to the boarding home where he lived, but noticed people in his room and escaped before he was seen. He moved elsewhere, found a new job, and weeks later he started seeing a woman named Elsa. But soon he had that same familiar feeling and ran away from her as well. Not wanting to return home, he fled to his old friend, Frederick Mullen. Fred invited Steve inside, and the delirious man confided in his friend, telling him about the aliens. Frederick then attempted to pull a gun, but Steve was ready, knocking out his old friend. He escaped to the cabin he was staying in, but found that Frederick and Elsa had beaten him there. Convinced the two were aliens, Steve fought back, but his foes insisted they had no intention of hurting him. In fact, Frederick explained that Steve was able to sense them because he was one of them. As it turns out, none of them were aliens at all, but mutants. Humans born with special powers like Steve's extrasensory perception. The mutants took Steve in where he finally felt at home, and yes, this story was published just over seven and a half years before the first X-Men comic. Neat, huh? The next story from Journey into Mystery number 42 is Farley's Other Face. The protagonist of this story is a smooth-talking con man named Ted Farley and his girlfriend Gladys. With his silver tongue, Ted was able to befriend a miserly old man named Barney Rupert, who rarely trusted anyone and kept his money hidden from everyone. Knowing this, Ted convinced Gladys to help him steal it and brought her to the old man's house, much to Rupert's dismay. Ted suggested they pick up some food so Gladys could prepare a proper meal, and the couple both kept their backs turned while Rupert retrieved the money to pay for it. But while the old man was preoccupied keeping a close eye on the unfamiliar woman, Ted peeked at his secret hiding spot. However, Gladys started to have misgivings about the plan, and while Rupert was upstairs, she told Ted that she wasn't going to take advantage of him. She tried to tell him something else, but Ted Farley was undeterred and snatched the money just as Barney Rupert came back down. Gladys pleaded with him not to do this, but Ted announced that he was just using her, too, and had no intention of marrying her. However, upon reaching his hiding place with the thousand dollars he'd stolen, Ted soon realized his mistake. Both Rupert and Gladys had witnessed the theft, and it seemed the police were hot on his trail when a detective arrived outside. He decided the best means of escape would be to change his identity, and met with a criminal surgeon who could help. Indeed, Farley's face and fingerprints were altered enough to be unrecognizable, but the procedure cost him all the money he'd stolen. 
weeks later, he saw in the newspaper that Bernie Rupert had passed away. Seems that the detective may have actually been a private eye looking for Ted because he was listed in Rupert's will. Investigating further with his new face, Ted spoke to the detective and found that Rupert had left $94,000 to him and Gladys. He insisted that he was Ted Farley, but without proof he wouldn't be able to collect the inheritance. He returned to the criminal doctor, but of course even the promise of ten grand wasn't enough to get him to testify that he'd been performing back alley surgeries. His final hope was Gladys, but of course she didn't recognize him. Or at the very least, she claimed not to recognize his voice, leaving Ted Farley broke. The next tale comes from 1958's Strange Worlds number 1, I Captured the Abominable Snowman. The star of this story is an unscrupulous man who learned of an expedition to find the legendary Yeti. He decided that he wanted to infiltrate the expedition in an attempt to steal the glory for himself. Posing as a magazine writer, he lied and bribed his way into spying on the scientists. When the opportunity arose, he stole their maps and equipment and prepared to make the journey alone. However, things began to fall apart when a blizzard caused him to lose his way. But then he came across a hidden monastery nestled in the snowy mountains. He also found large footprints around and followed them right to the inviting building. There he met an aging llama who brought him inside, warmed him up, and gave him food. The old man was no fool, mind you, and he observed the hungry man closely. When the llama spoke, he seemed to know exactly what the man was thinking. He told him that the tracks he saw did indeed belong to the Yeti, but warned him not to pursue it. However, the man was undeterred and warned the llama that he would start wrecking the temple if he didn't tell him how to find the beast. Acquiescing to this demand, the llama led him through the temple into a hot cavern leading to the other side of the mountain. There sat a strange instrument which the llama played to summon the yeti. The man waited patiently and could hear the crunching of snow as the creature approached. He was ready to fight, but the llama spoke to the yeti in an unrecognizable language. The creature kneeled and began weeping, and the man demanded that the llama command the yeti to follow him down the mountain. But the beast then began to change, and the llama explained that he was also someone who came seeking that which was not his and as a result was cursed to wander and ponder his sins until someone came to take his place. And so while the Yeti changed back to human form, the greedy human took the form of a furry white beast and wandered out onto the mountain, awaiting the day that someone else would come and free him. Our 1959 story is called I Became a Human Robot and comes from Tales of Suspense number 5. This tale begins with an alien race from billions of light years away who planned on invading Earth. First they decided to spy on the planet, starting with the military capabilities of the United States. To accomplish this, an alien agent named Gamus had his mind transferred into a humanoid robot. After landing on the planet, Gamus started walking through the human city and quickly garnered attention. This was of course all part of the plan, and he even saved a child from a careening truck to impress the onlookers. The gathering crowd wondered where the machine could have come from, but suspected it was built by some benevolent benefactor. After the robot stopped a bank robbery, government agents arrived on the scene to investigate. The robot was taken to Washington for study, and it was determined that it was constructed from materials not found on Earth. 
While scientists spent days analyzing the machine, at night Gamus would rise and start gathering government secrets. Eventually the day came when he was nearly finished and decided to return home that night after gathering the last pieces of information. But that same day, the scientists decided they weren't going to make any more headway in studying the machine and deactivated the mechanisms. What they didn't realize was that Gamus's brain was still active, and so when the robot body was put on display, the alien mind trapped inside was unable to move or act, and an alien invasion had been narrowly avoided without mankind ever even realizing. The next story from 1960 is called My Nightmare Has No End and was printed in Tales to Astonish number 12. This tale begins, of course, with a man who was quietly sleeping away. But suddenly the joyful dream he was having faded away with light and noise giving him a terrible headache. Pressure in his head stopped, but he looked up to witness the shadow of a strange alien creature. However, he soon awakened and realized it was all just a bad dream. Soon this happened again as the man was dreaming of being a beloved king. Again, the dream faded away and a shadowy creature appeared, but this time it warned that it would soon enter his dimension. The man awakened again and began to wonder if a being from another dimension really could be trying to contact him. Sure enough, several nights later, the man dreamed again and the alien being appeared before him. The creature explained that he came from a place called Zendu and had worked for months to meet with him like this. He claimed that Zendu was a peaceful world where disease was eradicated, labor was performed by machines, and people lived for a thousand years. He offered to switch bodies with the man and to let him live an idyllic life, but the man was obviously curious why the alien would give up such an existence. The alien started to answer, but the mind-swapping process had already begun. The real answer was that he'd grown bored of his lengthy, peaceful existence and desired the excitement and adventure of a new world. And so the mind of the human awakened in the body of the alien to enjoy a thousand years of paradise on Zendu. The alien, meanwhile, awakened in the man's body, only to find that he had chosen the wrong person to switch with as he was now locked in a prison cell on Earth. Our final story for today comes from Amazing Adventures number 3 and is simply called The Teddy Bear. This tale stars a woman named Carol who, like many, received a stuffed toy bear when she was just a little girl. She never seemed to outgrow the bear, loving it as she became an adult and even asking it for advice on who she should marry. When her husband, Jim, left on a business trip, he suggested that Carol have a girlfriend stay with her, but she insisted that Teddy would protect her. When Jim was later offered a job that involved several weeks in the mountains out west, Carol decided to go with him. But he was somewhat frustrated by her insistence of bringing the toy bear with her. In either case, Carol was an outdoorsy sort herself and enjoyed this time in the wilderness. Everything was going smoothly until one evening Jim found evidence of a mountain lion stalking their camp. That night he left his wife asleep in the tent with Teddy and planned to either drive away the animal or kill it. But as Jim searched for his prey, the big cat bolted past him heading right for the tent. His rifle jammed up, but he ran after the mountain lion regardless, ready to fight with his bare hands if he had to. But what he saw when he entered the tent was both a huge relief and incredibly shocking. The mountain lion was dead on the ground and Carol had slept through the whole thing. When she awakened, they both saw that Teddy had been scarred by some kind of claw marks. Nobody really knows what happened in the tent that night, but one thing is for certain. From that day on, Jim never wanted Carol to leave Teddy behind again and happily took the bear with them wherever they went. 
Hey heroes, that's all I've got time for this week, and if you enjoyed this video, please leave a like, share the video, and subscribe for more marvelous content. As always, the issues referenced in this video are listed in the description below if you would like to read them for yourself, as well as links to other places you can find me, including my Patreon page where for only a dollar a month you can get your name in these special thanks here. So until next time, true believers, Excelsior!